uh, why it, you know, uh, it's a mixture of things. People who fortune tellers who stood outside of shrines and rolled dice. They had dice in those days, you know. They really did. And uh, they would, you know, roll like, well, when I was a kid, they rolled it against the wall and played craps, they call it, and stuff like that. But they really rolled this stuff to get some sort of significance out of the numbers. Um, but do that as it may, Enoch is one of the patriarchs after Adam. And he lives for 770 years. And then what does the Bible say about him? All the other ones died around 900 some odd years, 800 some odd years. And that's all nonsense, obviously, and poetic exaggeration. They don't have to, no one feels very close. They attach to that. They only get angry at the New Testament. No one gets angry when you say something in the Old Testament is silly. Uh, but if you say something in the New Testament is silly, people get worked up. Uh, that just shows an attachment, a solidarity, uh, honoring the ancestors. You feel uh, just under threat there. But if you're not childish, and if you are like Paul, or as he said, uh, when I was a boy or a child, I saw things as a child. When I grew up, I put away childish things. But then he adds, as through a glass darkly, whatever he means by that, and it's been a favorite uh, uh, euphemism ever since. But I told you last time, and if I didn't, I keep talking about this, and this professor of mine, when I was your age, turned out to be a lunatic, actually, from what I later found out about him. He went way off the deep end and became a kind of um, Catholic sort of... Uh, action person who, um, I don't know what he was up to uh, during the student riots in Kansas. He, uh, he wasn't in the uh, Kansas raid or anything like that in the Civil War, but <laughs> later on Lawrence, Kansas is what, what was raided in the Civil War, if you recall. But in, at the University of Kansas, where he later transferred to, he was involved in all kinds of uh, weird stuff against the student activism of the 70s. But when I had him, it was only in the 50s, and he was a young uh, faculty member. He was pretty cool. Everyone loved him and thought he was really colorful. But he said something I never forgot, and I'm still talking about to this day. Poetry is truer than history. And, you know, I said, oh, my God, how clever this guy is so clever. And we'd like be, like, awestruck because he's so clever. What did he mean by that? He said, what does he mean by that? And so on and so forth. Well, I think what he meant by that, and what I think is very, very real and meaningful, is that it isn't what actually happened that people really care about. People only care about what the poets tell them happened. That is what the literature tells you happened. I take the Gospels as literature, not history. People don't really know the truth about what happened in that period, or didn't happen, and I don't know any more than you do. We weren't there. We didn't have tape recorders. But it, the literature is what people know. So the literature is what they recall. Take Islam, for instance. I'll get back to what I'm talking about, Enoch. Take Islam, for instance. I mean, I know Muslims all go around and you meet one and say, oh, we shouldn't be fighting. Jews and Arabs are cousins and brothers and so on and so forth. And, you know, you are the sons of uh, Jacob and we are the sons of Ishmael. What are you telling me? And why do they say that? Because Muhammad said that in the Quran. So they, I'm not saying, I don't want to do Muhammad get beheaded or something like that. But, uh, you know, they believe it, you know, just because it was said to them. But I'll bet if we took their DNA, we'd find out nine tenths of them have nothing to do with Ishmael at all. They're just conquered peoples. Many of them probably fought against Islam. Their parents probably fought against Islam. But when they were conquered and taken over, and their mindset was, you know, re, uh, re-stabbed. I only saw that movie, Alien. The little creatures in the spaceship. <laughs> and they're, I think, well, I forget the image, but they're like, you know, growing out of all these other creatures that are supposed to be, you know, being preserved in this spaceship, and out come these aliens one after another, these little monstrous aliens. The point is that, um, you know, in the Islamic world, the stamp is Muhammad. Whatever he said, everyone believes. And by the way, as I said last time, if you don't believe it, you better be careful because you can lose your head if you don't believe it. You know, so it isn't just that you do believe it, it's safer to believe it. Because when you have non-separation of church and state, as I said last time, 
that can become you know, a very seriously difficult problem. But anyway, what I'm trying to say, so he says in the Quran, oh, you know, we are the sons of Ishmael. Where did he get that from? The Bible. He got that from the Bible. Stories in the Bible. I'm not even sure it's true in the Bible. But the point of the matter is, I, you know, the Bible was talking about Sinai tribes, Sinai Midianites. They were talking about Joseph and uh, Midian and uh, Moses and Jethro and people like that. Uh, they, uh, you know, and they weren't talking about deep Arabia, and they certainly weren't talking about Iraq, and they certainly weren't talking about Egypt. And yet, if you go to Egypt or Iraq or Libya or Morocco or we're sons of Ishmael. You know, that's how a poetic image can become history. It's simpler. It's simpler. And as you say, we're, you know, your parents might have opposed the sons of Ishmael. Ten generations down the pipeline, your parents are totally forgotten. I think I asked you last time. How many people know anything about their great-grandparents? Very few. Some people don't even know their names. I mean, okay, you know your grandparents, presumably, but great-grandparents, what they did in their life, what did they do, what was their day-to-day -day life like, great-great-grandparents, you know, your memory, like, fails at that point, because your parents' memory can't go beyond that point, so that's, and if you bother to ask them, that's all they can communicate with you, but if you've written the Odyssey or the Iliad, which is why all the ancients wanted poets to sing their praises, because they knew if the poet sang their praises, their name would never die. And the poet's stories become the history. And that's true in the Gospels and a lot of other places, and the Old Testament too. I don't know about the story of Abraham. I'm sure there was some person like that at some point, but the stories about Abraham, they repeat themselves three different times. Uh, a lot of them resemble David. Looks like they were told in David's prayer to glorify David in some way and so on and so forth. So, you know, these are the storytellers. This is what primordial history is, is, is about. So when we say poetry is truer than history, that's what we mean. It's what people believe or think happened that matters, not, not what did happen. But now we have DNA, you see. And we can go to Egypt. My doctor is an Egyptian, I think I told you. He, he, he had his DNA done in the National Geographic Genome uh, Project. And he found out that he's been in Egypt for 40 centuries. And he was thrown. He said, I've been in Egypt. I'm an Egyptian from 40 centuries back. I Meaning he's not an Arab. He's an Egyptian. But if you asked him what he was, he would say he was an Arab. But I mean, he was so thrilled to have been an Egyptian from, from you know, 40 centuries ago or something like that, that that's what his DNA came out to, to be. At least that's what he told me. So the point is, <laughs> um, we have tools, and now we have the Dead Sea Scrolls. <clears throat> so those are very complicated documents, and that makes it much more complicated. The history becomes much more complicated because we actually have accounts that are contemporary with the events that occurred. You know, and they were hidden like a space capsule in camps. So now that makes everything a little more complicated, but people haven't digested that yet which is why a course like this is fun, important, and good to have. So anyway, let's go back to Enoch then. Obviously, Enoch never wrote any books. So why would someone put something under Enoch's name? Ah, because they wanted the prestige for it. They wanted the prestige for it. And so there's about, you know, ten different versions of Enoch's um, uh, supposed writings, and the main reason, again, why they wanted the prestige, because it says in the Bible, and he was seven, seven, he was 777 years old when he was taken up to heaven. When he was taken up to heaven, meaning Enoch didn't die. He's the primordial 